get started then. Hi guys, it's nice to meet you all. So my name's Meg, I'm a local GP here in Rushcliffe. I trained here in Nottingham and I used to work over at East Bridgeford and I've been locoming in the area for a little while. My kind of area of specialty is lifestyle medicine, particularly kind of preventative um, healthcare and looking at lifestyle factors and how they relate to disease and, and health. And today I'm gonna to present you a talk just principally on nutrition and diet because that's usually the one people are most interested in. And it's probably one of the biggest ones that we can physically change. Um, I could probably talk to you about this for three hours. I'm gonna try and condense it as much as I can. Um, these slides I've done actually, I did this a while ago for a different like a patient participation group. There's a lot of science in there. I'm not necessarily gonna present all of it. I'll skip through a lot of it if that's okay and kind of get to the bit that talks about different food groups and why they're important, and how to include them and that sort of thing. So we'll kind of get to the nuts and bolts rather than do too much of the background, but I want to go through some of it if that's okay. Um, I'm really happy for this to be totally informal. So if any of you don't get what I'm on about or you want to ask a question, just like pipe up in between, that's absolutely fine because we're quite a small group, so that's fine. And then at the back there on the side, I've got, got just a couple of different foods that I've made. Um, that you guys are welcome to try. We'll get to the end and then you can go and have a little look. I've put the recipes on there as well. If you don't fancy it, that's fine. There's no obligation, um, but they're there for you to have a little go and try and see what you think. Um, and we'll have some question time at the end. Um, so hopefully that's okay, we'll just crack on. Um, so this, this phrase was... was more people just... Are they just coming in? Okay, that's fine. We'll maybe just wait for them to come in so that they don't... Yeah. You're right, guys. No worries. You, all you've missed is me harping on about my own credentials. So it <laughs> wasn't very long. Um, my name is Meg. Hello, I'm a local GP with an interest in lifestyle medicine and preventative sort of healthcare. And I'm going to talk today about most about diet and nutrition. Um, so this phrase here is a quote from Hippocrates from two and a half thousand years ago, and it's just as valid now as it, as it was then. Um, this is one of my sciencey slides, so we're, just, we're gonna whiz over it. But basically, the Global Burden of Disease Study was a massive trial, massive study done um, several years ago, and it looked at the overall time spent with disease. So that means the overall time you spent ill, as well as any premature deaths, and it tried to work out what the major risk factors for either being really ill or dying early were. And this is what it came up with, that dietary risk factors, so diet, was the biggest contributor to both years lived with chronic ill health and premature deaths, and it outweighs the impact of smoking. So it's a really significant part of our health, actually, and it's often underlooked or under, um, underused as a, as a tool. There are currently 8.5 million people living in the UK with a long-term condition and diet is the single largest risk factor for the majority of those. So that's kind of the relevance of the talk today. I just like this slide, this is fun. <laughs> so no donuts today, but you know, every now and again, it's not such a bad thing. Uh, the UK diet is officially the worst diet in the whole of Europe. Now hopefully your diet doesn't look like this picture. Maybe it does, maybe it has in the past, but certainly, um, ultra processed foods, which are examples like um, uh, crisps, nuggets, sweets, carbonated drinks, microwave meals, frozen pizzas, they're really high in saturated fats and salt and sugar. They're found to make up more than half of all the meals consumed in the UK. So more than half of all of our food is this sort of stuff, um, which kind of, um, which is quite shocking actually. I kind of assumed that it was quite a small part of, of most people's diet, but it's not anymore. Um, they have a really big impact on our health and chronic disease and it's not surprising that the UK also ranked the most obese out of all 19 nations that they studied in the whole of Europe. Um, so it's quite, it's, quite a big, it's quite a big issue in our, in our country. Um, I'm going to whiz through these ones. So cardiovascular disease, heart disease and stroke is our number one killer in the UK. It kills almost one in three people is the ultimate cause of death. Um, risk factors for developing it diet 
is much bigger a risk factor than smoking, again, for heart disease. So people often think about heart disease and stroke and, oh, well, they smoked and this, that, and the next thing. But actually, your diet has a bigger impact on your risk of heart disease and stroke than anything else. Um, and in the Western world, so the UK, Europe, America, children as young as 10 years old already have evidence of these fatty streaks in their arteries that are caused by um, convenience foods, highly processed foods, saturated fats and cholesterol in our diet. At the age of 10, we're already developing the things that will go on to develop heart disease later on. So it's a big issue. Um, cancer, uh, rates are rising dramatically. If you're born after 1960, if you're lucky enough, um, if you're male and born after 1960, you've got a one in two chance of developing cancer in your lifetime. If you're female, it's one in three. And 40% of all cancer cases and half of all deaths from cancer are directly preventable through better lifestyle choices. That includes things like smoking, that's not just dietary, but um, the top risk factors, if you combine all of the risk factors, the top risk factors are mostly related to diet and weight. Again, it has a really big impact on cancer. At least we touched on a little bit before. Um, there's a real increase in most, most parts of the Western world now with, with, with being overweight. Almost two thirds of us are overweight and obese in this country. Um, and about 28% of our population, that's nearly one in three are obese. Um, one in five year six children are overweight um, and obese. So one in five, 20% of our year six children are obese. So it's massive health consequences, especially in childhood. If you are really overweight as a child, it really sets children up for the significant health implications as an older person. So if we can try to um, make some changes and particularly around diet and, and looking at our family's diet, how we eat can impact how others in our family eat. Um, and what we learn about nutrition impacts wider people around us, including the children that we bring up. Um, type 2 diabetes, so some of the people in this room may be, suffer may be suffering with type 2 diabetes. There are 3.8 million people in the UK that are currently diagnosed. <coughs> Probably over half a million who are living with it, but haven't been diagnosed yet. So it's one of these insidious things that comes on without many symptoms. If um, nothing changes by the year 2035, there'll be 5 million in the UK suffering with diabetes. Um, so it has a really big impact as well. And again, um, as we saw before, diet and nutrition has a massive impact on your risk of type 2 diabetes. Um, so move on. Belgium has recently adopted probably the most forward-thinking dietary guidance that I've ever seen. Um, there's a couple of other nations that have adopted similar ones since, but Belgium really kind of flew the flag and went out there as a pioneer and developed dietary guidance that actually reflected what the science shows. Most dietary guidance, particularly in the Western world, is heavily influenced by other factors, politics, economic, farming, food industry. They all play a role, but Belgium went ahead and just issued what the science says we should be eating. So they've done this inverted pyramid, and in the top dark green section you can see like whole plant foods, so fruits, vegetables, beans, pulses, legumes, and whole grains. Those are on the right hand side, like noodles and whole grain bread and rice. Um, small amounts of nuts and seeds as well and I think that's um, I think that is extra virgin olive oil that's supposed to represent then in the slightly smaller smaller section we've got um, dairy eggs cheese uh, white meats and fish which should make up a much smaller part of our diet and in the really really bottom one uh, we've got um, butter and red meats and those sorts of things now what they've done is they've actually taken out a whole section of foods that really we shouldn't really be consuming hardly at all, which no other food pyramid's ever done. It's never shown the foods on one side and said, look, really, these are not the things we should be eating. And they include alcohol, ultra-processed foods that we talked about, salt, processed meats, bacon, um, hams, those sorts of things, um, and um, you know, crisps and fries and that sort of thing. Um, so the things that have been shown to be actively harmful for our health been taken out of the food pyramid everything else has been stratified according to how much really we should be having as part of our diet this is another nice way to look at it so it's not a food pyramid or food guidance particularly but it's like a traffic light approach so looking at um, our minimally processed mostly plant foods as being our green light you can have as many of those as you want there's really no restriction whatsoever the more you can pack in the better and then in our yellow section are our processed foods, so things like um, uh, yeah, like our baked potato or our breads rather than the whole grains um, and vegetables that have been processed. 
um, into smoothies or sauces or, or various other things. Um, and we should also include their unprocessed animal foods. So those are like fish and, and chicken and the things that we saw in that smaller section of the pyramid. And then in our red section, those are the things that they took out of the pyramid on that first slide that we saw, the things that we really shouldn't be eating very much at all. And those are our ultra processed plant foods, so our chips and our crisps and our biscuits and our cakes and our ice creams and processed animal foods, which would be things like um, high fat cheeses and spreads and um, uh, bacon and ham and all sorts of things. So that's a, just a different way of looking at it that kind of presents the same sort of information. The reason being is that the more we process food, the more goodness we take out of it. So essentially when we process food, we generally take good things out of it, usually fibre, and we add a bunch of other stuff into it to make it tastier. And that means adding usually salts and fats and sugars and taking out some of the whole grains. So we make that food much easier to digest. So it gets digested really quickly and absorbed really fast. And we add a whole bunch of other stuff in it that our body doesn't really need or want, but just tastes really amazing. So the more down the green end we can be where things are hot in their whole form and haven't been processed and still got all of their fiber and things with them, the better. Does that kind of make sense so far? I've kind of rattled through that first section. Um, so then that's sort of talking about how we can eat that in a way that kind of looks at maybe trying to prevent some of these diseases. But what about if you already suffer with one of these ill health problems? What if you already suffer with heart disease or you've already had a stroke or you already have type 2 diabetes? Is there any evidence to show that changing a diet can actually reverse any of that? So for all the pills that we doctors prescribe, there is nothing, no medicine that we give to a patient that will reverse the causes of high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, diabetes. There's no medical cure for any of those things. We give drugs to reduce the symptoms and to bring our um, blood pressure back into a better, a better line or to bring our cholesterol down, but we've not actually reversed any of the reason why it was high in the first place. All we're doing is masking some of the symptoms and hopefully reducing the risk that someone goes on to have something significant. But the thing that can make a difference and actually reverse some of these problems is diet. So there's lots of other lifestyle factors which are important, but today we're just focusing on diet. So for example, for our number one killer, what did we say our number one killer was in the UK? Can anyone remember? The thing that kills more of us than anything else? Mm -hmm. Heart disease, cardiovascular disease, so we'll lump a stroke in with that. That's our number one killer. There is actually a cure, and it doesn't involve any drugs, pills, or potions. It's been well documented in the scientific community for probably the last 40 years, and that's diet. Um, oh, where's this slide gone? <laughs> So um, it goes back to sort of the research that doctors did back in the 70s and 80s, where they looked at populations who were the longest lived in the world. So populations where people routinely lived to almost 100 and over 100. And they did lots of studies to say, well, why? Why are these people so healthy? Why don't they have heart disease? Why don't they die of cancer at 50? Um, so, for example, in Japan, ischemic heart disease was virtually unheard of. In parts of Kenya, it was 20 times lower in the US and the UK. And at first they thought, well, maybe it's genetic, because you know they're different, they have different genes, maybe it's that. And then they studied those groups and those populations who came to live in the US and in the UK and Europe. And what they found is within 10 or 15 years, their risk was almost the same as ours. And certainly by the next generation, their risk was exactly the same as ours. So it wasn't their genes, it was what they were doing. So then they started to look at their diet, particularly other elements of their lifestyle too. But for example, when they looked at their diet, their populations were eating almost exclusively out of the top part of this pyramid. 90% of their diet was here. They didn't really eat very much of anything else. It was all here. So sweet potatoes, fresh fruits, rice, other whole grains, um, almost no animal products. They did eat some, so usually they'll have a little bit of fish, a little bit of chicken. Um, very occasionally they might eat something something else, but um, they certainly didn't have any refined or processed foods. They didn't have baby bells, and they didn't have fruit juice, and um, and they didn't have margarine. You know, everything was up here. Um, so whole plant foods seem to be the, seem to be the answer, excluding these processed foods, meats and dairy. Um, this is a study that they did back in America remember how long ago it was, I've probably got it written down, but it's been some time now. And some researchers decided, okay, well, if these people seem to have no cardiovascular disease and this is their diet, what about if people already have cardiovascular disease and we put them on that diet? 
Does it make any difference? Once you've already got the disease, can it be reversed? This is, um, this is a scan here of an artery in somebody's heart. And the white part, that you can see it looks a bit like lightning, that's the dye going through the artery, okay? And at the bottom here, where it says in brackets distal LAD, that part of the artery has gone all narrow and knobbly, and it looks quite gnarly. And that's because the artery is quite furred up, so it's got lots of atherosclerosis, which is cholesterol and plaques in there, all bunging it up. If you've ever tried to clear out one of your drains in the sink, and all that stuff comes out, essentially that's what's in this artery. So it's made it really, really thin down there. They put these people on a pretty much plant sort of food diet, certainly whole foods, no refined grains. They also did some other things. They made sure that they stopped smoking and they made sure that they, you know, got lots of, lots of additional exercise and stuff. But mostly it was the significant of the dietary change. Um, within, within about a year and a half, that person's artery had completely unblocked itself had completely unblocked itself. This person was not on, they got taken off all of their other drugs. Drugs don't really unblock arteries, they just stop them from getting more blocked. They'd never seen reversal of cardiovascular disease with anything ever before. And this did a better job than the surgery that people were offered when they go in there and they sort of scoop all the muck out. Um, so that was the first time that it had been shown that actually just changing your diet was enough. And generally speaking, that's because our bodies want to be well. Our bodies want to be healthy. And they are really good at it. They're really good at being healthy. And we can do all sorts to our bodies and it can be overcome. So we can you know, drink a little bit too much and the next day we feel a bit icky, but you know, after that, the body recovers. We can you know, not drink enough water, we might get a bit of a headache and then the body recovers. It has a great way of managing itself. But if we repeatedly, day after day, meal after meal, for 20 to 30 years, cause it harm, eventually it can't keep up and it, we do suffer disease. If we take away that harm, the body will heal itself. In majority of cases, we take that away, it will give it an opportunity to heal. So it certainly is, is possible. Um, these aren't very fun, are they? <laughs> This is, a, this is a person on a cocktail of drugs, which are sort of keeping them going. Um, and I'm not anti-drugs, I'm not anti-medication, they absolutely have a role and are certainly necessary for a lot of conditions. Um, but I think it's important that people understand that they're not the only answer and actually not an answer. They don't get rid of anything, they just kind of manage it. And if you were given the option of a pill that would make your blood pressure completely disappear and would, you know, um, cure your diabetes potentially, um, you would take it in a, in a heartbeat. And I think knowing that actually a change like this can be as powerful as that is really helpful. It just gives you, gives you power, doesn't it? Um, so we know that in general, a diet that's rich in kind of whole plant foods is the most healthful diet, but I guess are there any specific foods that offer additional protection? So when we think about it, are there some that we should definitely look to include? And that's kind of what I wanted to focus on today, because I think it's more helpful to know exactly, well, what could I have then? What should I include? And that's kind of where we're going to focus most of this, if that's all right. Um, did anyone have any questions about what we just talked about in terms of what the science showed or what the data shows or anything that's brought up anything for you? I just think watching the, the two, the dramatic change in yeah. the arteries is yeah. um it's quite opening isn't it when, yeah. you, see, when you see that and yeah. um yeah to show that, that such a big change can happen just as a result of yeah. literally just changing what you put in your mouth it's it is really impressive um so foods that are the most protective so um look if we look back again i talked about those populations in the world that um had such long lifespans and lived with <coughs> And lived without disease for such a long period of time one of the things they did was look at all of their diets and say well do anything overlap because these um these these groups of people lived all over the world so there are areas in there's an area in japan there's one in um in greece there's another one in america um there's one in north africa so if you can imagine these populations were not eating similar diets they had completely different diets they're completely different cultures and yet they were seeing the same health benefits. So they had a little look at the diets and said, right, which things overlap? One of the things that they found um, was um, legumes. So by legumes, I mean beans, peas, lentils, 
and those sorts of things. It includes um, soybeans like edamame, you find that in tofu, for example. Um, that's not something that a lot of us in the UK eat much of. I mean, with the exception of jacket and beans, we don't have very high legumes in this country. So if you go to places like Mexico and Central America, they eat beans and lentils and those sorts of things all the time. If you go to places in North Africa, there's um, loads and loads of lentil dishes. If you go to India, they eat grain and legumes. You know, but in the UK and in the West World, we don't really eat a lot of beans. Um, but the evidence showed a massive improvement. And um, um, one of the American Institute for Cancer research papers, where they looked at risks of cancer and dietary improvements, actually found that um, if you ate whole greens with legumes for virtually every meal, your risk of cancer was massively reduced. So they're a really good source of vegetable protein. They're packed full of protein, um, so it's starchy carbohydrate as well, loads of fibre. And we'll talk about fibre in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, and some uh, minerals like folate and vitamin K. They're really low in saturated fat. Um, and so increasing your legume consumption is associated with lower weight and lower blood pressure, um, which, is, which is significant. So, um, it's probably better than a calorie controlled diet for reducing your weight circumference, for example, and improving your blood pressure control. So just increasing your legumes, not counting your calories, actually has a better chance of, of improving your weight, weight loss. <coughs> um, lots of other benefits, so the fiber, the folate, and the phytates, which is a particular type of chemical in beans, um, reduce your risk of stroke, cancer, depression, um, and there are phytoestrogens. Phytoestrogen is a plant form of our female hormone estrogen. I say female, men have estrogen too. Um, and they're particularly in high concentration in soybeans. Um, so edamame, tofu, those sorts of things um, are high in phytoestrogens. They actually reduce breast cancer rates. People worry a lot about eating phytoestrogens if they have breast cancer in their family or if they've had breast cancer. The evidence shows that actually it reduces your rate of breast cancer and increases your chance of survival if you've had it. So really significant um, and important <coughs> food to, to add in. Um, berries, these are particularly valuable. They're grouped separately from other fruits because they're so much better. Um, so they've got way more antioxidants. Antioxidants is kind of an old term now that we use for stuff that's in food that fights things and uh, improves your body ability to repair, improves your immune function, all that sort of thing. Uh, we actually know now it's, it's, a, it's a compound in plants called polyphenols and they're plant compounds that help our bodies sort of process it. Um, but they're absolutely packed full of them. They've got 10 times more polyphenols and antioxidants than any other fruits or vegetables. So berries is a really key one. And the reason is because they're so pigmented. So we often find that the more vibrant the color of your food, the more of these important plant chemicals that they have and the more beneficial they are. So the darker green, the more bitter, the more vibrant the color, the better. And berries do come into that um, category. So um, American Cancer Society did a study. They found that the people that ate the most berries were significantly less likely to die from heart disease. Um, and there's also been um, a really, really long-term health study done over in America called um, the Nurses' Health Study. It's based over in Harvard University. They've got like 16,000 women over the course of about 50 years. So really, really long-term studies. They found that simply one serving of blueberries a day showed a slower rate of cognitive decline. So that's things like Alzheimer's and dementia. So one serving of blueberries a day um, sh slowed the rate of decline by two and a half years compared to those that didn't have any kind of berries in their diet. So something as simple as adding in some berries. So um, for people that are already showing cognitive decline, that can be a really good thing to add in actually, because it'll, it, won't keep, it won't prevent it, but it will slow the rate of decline. So really good evidence for berries. Other fruits, so obviously that includes apples, bananas, melon, mangoes, kiwis, all those sorts of things. Um, the reason that we um, harp on about fruits is because they are so, so good. So um, when we talked before about the global burden of disease study, that really early slide I showed with all the bar charts coming across that looked at all the people who'd either lived with ill health for many years or who died prematurely. And they looked at why, and we saw that diet was probably one of the number one risk factors. Um, when we looked at, well, what 
what particular parts of someone's diet contributed to that. The number one, the worst aspect of our diet was not eating enough fruit. So simply not eating enough fruit was the, was the biggest, had the biggest impact on our health, followed swiftly by not eating enough nuts. So it wasn't eating too many packets of crisps, it was not eating enough fruit. So simply adding that in, um, it has, has huge health benefits. And again, that's about all of those important plant compounds that I talked about with the berries, but also it's really high in fibre and lots of vitamins. Um, our current research, our current guidance in the UK um, suggests five portions of fruits and vegetables a day. Does anyone know where that kind of guidance came from and why it's five? Is it one more than Australia? <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> Does anyone know how many people in the UK actually eat five portions of fruit and veg a day? No. One in four. It's about a quarter of, of adults in the UK, let's not include the children that being lower, a quarter of adults in the UK eat five portions of fruit and vegetables a day. The actual science, the actual guidance, suggests 10, 10 is a much more accurate number. So um, most, the most benefit could be gained by eating 10 portions of fruits and vegetables, it includes both together, per day. Um, in America, they've actually changed their guidance in the last few years to say nine, which is close. In the UK, they talked about it, um, because that's what the evidence shows, they talked about it, and they decided that as most people weren't even getting close to five, Telling them they should eat 10 would just be a bit off-putting, so they didn't bother. So, as a result, nobody knows, and they think if they get two or three, they're like, well, it's close to five, but actually they, they don't realise they're so far off where we're meant to be. Um, I think it's criminal not to tell people actually what the evidence shows, but anyway, that's, that's where it is. So, um, anyone here been told to reduce their fruit consumption because they should be worried about the sugar content? Three, at least. It's a really common misconception, a really common misconception. The sugar in a fruit is completely different from the sugar in a biscuit or the sugar that you add to your tea. It's bound up in fibre, so within that fruit all of, the, all of the juices and all of the sugars are bound to the fibre of the fruit and it's really difficult for us to digest that and just get sugar. The fibre actually really slows how we absorb it and we don't even absorb all of it. Whereas if you have table sugar, you will absorb every single molecule of that glucose. It's got nothing else to, to prevent it. What about the smoothies, though, or the, or the fruit juices? Fruit juices are different. Fruit right. juices where you've extracted all of the juice and you haven't got any of the pulp or the skin um, mean that that's just as bad as a, as a, as a sugary drink, really, right. because it's just loose sugar. Yeah. Smoothies is slightly different. It's better than a fruit juice because it's still got all of the pulp and everything in there. And if you think about it, it's probably pretty similar to what our mouths do. But I guess with a smoothie, it's just to bear in mind that it's much more mushed than yes. we would. You will still absorb way more of it than you would if you just ate the banana or ate the apple. Um, but you're still getting all of the goodness at least. You haven't left any of that yeah. behind. Um, but studies actually show that increased fruit consumption improves blood sugar control and it lowers mm. your risk of diabetes. So when they gave diabetics um, a sugary drink solution, they monitored what happened to their blood sugar afterwards. They gave them the sugary drink solution, their blood sugar spiked, as you'd expect, took a while to come down. Then they thought, right, well, we'll give them the sugary solution, but we'll also add an equal quantity of sugar, but this time in blackberry juice. Um, so they took the juice from blackberries that was the same amount of the sugary syrup, and they gave them the sugary syrup and the blackberry juice. So you'd expect, well, now they're having double the amount of sugar, essentially, um, you'd expect a bigger spike. But actually what happened is their blood spike was a little bit slower and a little bit shallower. So even though they had more sugar, because they had the fruit juice with the sugar, it wasn't, as much, wasn't absorbed as much. Then they thought, okay, well, what happens if we give them the sugary syrup and the same quantity of sugar, but in blackberries? So we give them a pun of black, handful of blackberries to eat and then watch what happened to their blood sugar. And their blood sugar did not spike. It was a slow release because the fibre of the blackberries and everything that was bound up with it actually slowed the absorption of the sugar that they'd given them. So it made a big difference. So unless you are juicing all of your fruits and drinking gallons of orange juice, actually eating whole fruits improves your blood sugar control. So it's a misconception to avoid fruits if you're diabetic or you're at risk.
of diabetes. And more fruit consumption is also associated with lower weight. So the more fruit you eat, the more likely you are to be a healthier weight. Um, so as I said before, whole plant foods do not behave in the same way as their individual ingredients once we take them out, and they shouldn't be considered as the same. Cruciferous vegetables, a bit of a mouthful. Cruciferous vegetables mean the group of vegetables that include broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, um, certain cabbages and kale. Um, and these are excellent sources of um, antioxidants. There's a particular type of plant chemical called sulforaphane, which is a key ingredient which boosts the kind of liver's detoxifying ability. And um, the, the, the benefit effect that you get from eating these, these can actually be seen even weeks later. So including these into your diet on a regular basis, again, been shown to reduce cognitive decline. Um, and has a key role in cancer prevention, um, particularly reduced risk of prostate cancer progression. Um, so people with prostate cancer progress more slowly, they have more cruciferous vegetables in their diet, um, reduced chance of breast cancer recurrence, if you've suffered with breast cancer and you have a diet high in cruciferous veggies, you're less likely to get a recurrence of your breast cancer, and also reduces spread of lung cancers. So it has a real kind of immune boosting um, and repair function, it's really useful. Lots of us don't like these, they're really bitter, they're kind of farty smelling when we overcook them and they're difficult for lots of people to tolerate it but actually they, the reason they're so beneficial is because of that bitterness. The bitterness tells you that we've got loads of really good um, plant chemicals in them. This one's greens. We don't like greens in this country. No one eats greens. They remember them from the 70s where they were stewed into oblivion and piled onto your plate. But actually your mother was right when she said eat your greens. These are one of the healthiest types of vegetable that exist. They're really rich in nutrients. They're high in potassium, iron, zinc, magnesium, folate, you know, huge, huge portions of those in, in each one of these. Did you know that calcium is actually better absorbed from a leafy green than it is from cow's milk? So you get more, well, you don't necessarily get more calcium. You find it a lot easier to absorb it from leafy greens. So, um, yeah, it was particularly as we're getting older and we're thinking about calcium and bones and those sorts of things, leafy greens have a real role to play there. Um, protective against heart disease and high blood pressure. Should I ask about lettuce? Mm -hmm. I've heard that iceberg lettuce has no nutritional content in there whatsoever. Even no, iceberg water, lettuce, please. even the lowly iceberg lettuce, which let's face it is 99.9% .9 water, yeah has huge numbers of, of, of plant chemical, healthy phytonutrients in it. Okay. Much, much, much lower levels than collard greens and, and rocket and spinach, yeah. yes. But even, even the lowly iceberg lettuce has loads of good stuff in there. Okay. So if that was the only thing that you could tolerate, it's still better than, mm -hmm. than nothing at all. Mm -hmm. But yes, it is of, of, all of, the, of all of the lettuces, it's pretty, it's pretty lettuce, poor really. Yeah. So the other lettuces, the more bitter ones, the ones that have got more colour, more vibrancy. Again, the more bitter, the more colourful, the better, generally speaking. Um, what's that one that I can't talk? Chicory, I can't. I can't, oh, I can't eat that. Cannot eat it. I, I, try, I, I love my bitter foods, and even I can't yeah. talk. I tried adding it to a smoothie once, and it completely yeah. ruined the whole thing. Try with orange, orange and chicory. Orange, salad. yeah, it does go well with orange. Yeah. Yes. So interestingly, if you do pair your bitter, bitter vegetables with something sweet, it massively reduces the bitterness. So a little bit of balsamic vinegar on them if you find them too bitter. Even just a little bit of demerara sugar. Like if you're really struggling to get younger ones to eat their greens, it's better to have a tiny bit of sugar on them and they eat them than that they don't eat them at all. So that can be a really useful tip for getting little ones. I used to do a little bit of honey drizzled on, um, on broccoli for my little ones. Now they love, they don't need the honey anymore, they just love the broccoli, but it was a really good way of getting them to eat it when they were little. And a mixture of cooked and raw is really helpful to absorb all of the nutrients from your, from your cruciferous and your leafy greens particularly. So when they're raw, they have certain enzymes in them that help us to digest those chemicals better. When we cook them, we get rid of those enzymes and we can only absorb part of the part of the goodness. So if you can have a mixture of raw and cooked, you just increase what you can absorb from them. I will sometimes chop up a broccoli, for example, and then whilst the florets are steaming, I'll munch on the I'll munch on the stalk and sometimes I'll dip that in a little bit of hummus or sauce or something and I'll munch on it while I'm cooking. Um, or I'll have a little bit of something on the side, um, so just a few of the little leaves off them, off the broccoli that we sometimes chop and throw away, just sprinkle them on and have them raw. 
it massively increases. The steam is better than boiling anyway. Steam is better than boiling, yes. So when you boil your vegetables, obviously all of the goodness that comes out um, leaches out into the water and then you end up chopping the water away. If you do want to boil your veggies though, save the save the water and use it for and making gravy. stocks and gravies yeah. and soups and stuff. Yeah. Then you reabsorb all of the goodness. The steaming is better and um, the more al dente, just the better. They are. They taste a lot better if you don't overcook them. They tend to go a bit, a bit chunky. Um, other veggies we talked about, so we know that the more fruits and vegetables you have in your diet, the better, up to 10 portions. Um, and um, the different different types of vegetables offer different nu nutrients. And, and when we talk about nutrients, it's not just vitamins and minerals, which they obviously all have different amounts of, but those phytonutrients, those special plant compounds we talked about. So if you imagine all of these vegetables here have all got different colors. Every vegetable that's a different color has a different compound in them that's useful. And this is where this phrase, like eating a rainbow, came from. It's because the more different varieties of colour you eat, the more different varieties of those compounds you have, and the better um, for you. In particular, onions and garlic, the allium family, so onions and garlic, are, have very potent um, protective agents in them. So they have much better cancer prevention um, abilities than some of our other vegetables, um, with the exception of spinach and cruciferous veggies. Onions and garlic come next on our list of list of really powerful vegetables. Whole grains. So by whole grains, we don't mean wheat and more wraps or seeded, essentially white bread. Um, we mean whole grains. So when you're going to buy bread in the supermarket, have a little look on the ingredient label on the back. If wheat flour is the first ingredient, that's white bread with stuff in it. Mm -hmm. It has to say whole meal wheat flour for it to be a wholemeal bread. Um, you'll find it really difficult to find one that wholemeal wheat flour is the first ingredient for. Even your sourdoughs and all of your rye and spelt loaf will still say wheat flour as 99% of what's in there with a little bit of the other things added in. You really are looking for the whole grains and that means that none of the, none of the fibre's been taken out. All, right? all of that is there ready for you to, to um, to absorb and to digest. And then other grains, let's not forget that wheat is not the only grain we can eat, tends to be, but we've also got barley, oats, corn, quinoa, and various other grains. And all of those grains offer different benefits. Um, the Global Burden of Disease study that I've been harping on about that was right at the beginning, when they looked at diet, they estimated that um, whole grains can dramatically reduce your risk of diabetes, for example. Whereas white and refined grains increase your risk of diabetes. So white bread, white pasta, white rice, all of that sort of stuff increases your risk of those, heart, those conditions, whereas the whole grains and the brown versions decrease your risk. Um, so if you're thinking about switching over, because when you've had white bread and white pasta and white rice for 40 years, it's really difficult to switch the whole grain because it tastes, yeah, it's grainy, isn't it? It's different, different taste. Um, you can just try doing half and half, <coughs> and that can be quite a good mix if you can't do the whole the whole hog and I did that with my girls when they were really little we did um, white rice and brown rice and we just mixed mixed did half and half and same with pasta until and increased the amount until eventually we, we switched completely and it's much easier than to just do a straight swap um we've done whole grains anyway yeah um flax seeds so flax seeds are particularly they're, they're they're looked at separately from other nuts and seeds because of how beneficial they are. So does anyone know what flaxseed is? Or heard of flaxseed? It's different from sesame seed. Its other name is linseed. You might know it better as linseed. So flax or linseed, it's the same thing, has huge benefits, particularly around cholesterol and blood pressure reduction. So um, we need to grind it to absorb it properly, it needs to be milled or ground, which you can do yourself in a little blender if you want to buy the whole ones, or you can actually buy packets of them, them ground. They're so beneficial for cholesterol and blood pressure that just a tablespoon a day can have massive, massive impact. So um, they're really easy actually to add to things. So like you can add them to a yogurt or a smoothie, or you can put them in your cereal and, or in your oats. I have them every morning in oats. Um, so they're particularly good. And nuts is something that we don't always eat a huge amount of in the UK as well, um, other than in peanut butter, which depending on the type you have is probably not the greatest for you. But um, the Global Burden of Disease study estimated that about two and a half million lives are lost every year across the globe through not eating enough nuts and seeds. That's bonkers really, isn't it? 
two and a half million a year just because you don't eat enough nuts and seeds. That's the benefit it would have if you ate more nuts and seeds. That's 15 times more than the amount of large loss to illicit drug use just by not eating enough nuts and seeds. So they're a really important part of our diet. Um, walnuts are the best. If you wanted to know if there's one nut that's better than the others, walnuts are the best. Again, they're the bitter, the more bitter, aren't they? Um, they have a much um, higher antioxidant level than the other nuts and their omega-3 levels, the healthy sort of, um, the healthy fats that we, that really reduce inflammation, they've got much more of them in, in each. And you only need like a hand, a handful a couple of times a week. So you don't have to eat you know, huge quantities of them, just a handful a few times a week can have a really, really um, big impact. Sorry, you had your hand up. I was just going to say, nuts is even bad press, aren't it? Because of the calorific value. Yeah, I was just going to so ask that. So it's like, is it good to advise people? To yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. excellent because I was going to ask, is anyone worried about the high fat content yeah. in nuts and would tend to avoid them, especially if you're looking to watch your weight? Yeah, particularly. So in actual fact, increased nut consumption, and this is whole nuts, not slathering nut butter on something because that's different. We can eat way more nut butter than we can whole nuts. But increased nut consumption does not lead to expected weight gain. Um, and regular consumption of a handful five times a week extends lifespan by about two years. So if we're talking about whole nuts in their whole form and a small handful, so no more than 15 to 20 grams a couple of times a week, no, it doesn't lead to any increased weight compared to people who don't eat their nuts. If you're having, you know, 50 grams of peanut butter a day on your, on your white toast, probably. <laughs> and if you are really looking to, you really are looking to drop weight and you're needing to do it quickly, then obviously making sure you're only having them a few times a week rather than every day is sensible, but no, it doesn't lead to increased weight gain. And again, that's because the fats are absorbed differently from how we absorb fats in oils or fried food. It's very, very different. Um, and they are all very healthy fats as well. And then this last one, so spices. These are a really, really important part of our diet. Um, massively high in these antioxidants we've been we've been harping on about, um, and they've got the highest concentration of antioxidants of any food spices. So should be added to all of your food if you can. Um, and they've been used as medicines for thousands of years, particularly turmeric. So you probably heard a bit about turmeric. Curcumin is the active ingredient of turmeric. Um, that's the pigment that appears to have the greatest potential. It acts across a range of diseases, actually. So it's been used as improve, it improves arterial function, that's your blood flow. Um, it improves symptoms of arthritis in studies. Um, it's been used against a number of cancers as well. You don't need that much of it. So an eighth of a teaspoon in a meal that's enough to feed several people is plenty. If you pair it with black pepper, you absorb far more of it. So if you're gonna add it to an omelet or a stew or a curry or whatever it is that you're making, um, grind a little bit of black pepper in with it and you'll get much, much better absorption of turmeric. Um, they did a study, um, this was a really good study actually. So when we're talking about studies, the like gold standard is what we call a randomized, controlled, blind uh, trial. Um, and they did a study using saffron um, against one of the leading Alzheimer drugs, um, and that was Aricept. And saffron had a better effect of slowing the progression of Alzheimer's than Aricept, mm -hmm. which is the major drug. Mm -hmm. And it had no side effects whatsoever. So really powerful things that we don't use very much necessarily in our cooking. So for example, I'll add cinnamon every single day to my oats. So I always have cinnamon in my oats. Mm -hmm. And then if I'm cooking something, if, even if I'm just having veggies, like a side of greens, which is just like, eh, isn't it blonde? That doesn't taste very nice. But even just sprinkling a little bit of um, mixed spice on them or a little bit of cumin on them just adds to the flavour. just means you get a load of spices and it makes them more tolerable as well. So, what, so what, Meg, what sort of quantities are you really small amounts you don't need no. a lot at all really small amounts because they're so powerful they're so concentrated that really you only need just a sprinkling so i use quite a lot of cinnamon in my oats and you're welcome to go and try them in a bit um but for example when you use them in your cooking you know paprika and cumin and those mm. sorts of things like a teaspoon in your in your stews or your curries um is fine and you can mix them up and you can use the sweet ones in your your puddings and, and things um, so it doesn't need, doesn't need a lot. No. The evidence shows actually just a tiny amount has benefits. Mm. Um, these were just a few slides, I think, looking at... Um, oh, these, these were all the posh, these were all the nice photos. <laughs> I went through the boring list and I should have been doing this. It's been a while since I've given this talk. There you go, these are how lovely our foods kind of look, so I'll let you just 
have a wonderful time looking out and looking there. So that's our cruciferous veggies, so Brussels sprouts, um, celeriac and pak choy is an excellent source of vitamin C. Um, our leafy greens, which includes herbs as well, so um, parsley and, um, and mint and other herbs. Um, that's our general veggies. So yeah, the more colourful the better. So if you can get a range of colours into your day, the better. <laughs> Occasionally do something with my kids where I give them a little chart and we count off all the colours they've eaten in the day. And they have like a rainbow chart and they tick off all the different colours that they had in the day and see if they can manage to get their rainbow in a day. And this is a quote from this gentleman called Dennis Burkitt. Societies that eat unrefined foods produce large stools and build small hospitals. Societies that eat fibre depleted foods produce small stools and build large hospitals. So the more fibre we can eat, the healthier we are. And there's a reason for that. So fibre is really important at feeding our gut bugs. So the gut microbiome is the new sort of word du jour. And it means all of the healthy bugs that live in our gut that actually not only help us to digest our food, but they actually help to produce all of the compounds that our body needs to do its job. So they switch on and off our genes. They decide which genes we're going to express and which genes we're not going to express. They decide whether we produce hormones that day or not. And they get turning things on and off all the time and they love fibre. So when we don't feed them very much fibre, we get a much reduced, depleted sort of gut microbes and we don't, we don't operate as well, basically. We need to fuel them in order to have all of our processes working really smoothly. Sorry to interrupt you, but where do you get all of the, the enzymes from in the beginning? To do what? In what sense? In, in your gut, mm. that feed off the fibre. Yeah. Where do they come from in the, the beginning? The, the bacteria. Where do you get them? They, come in, they, they usually come from the foods that we eat and the things we come into contact with as well. So just our environment helps to build our gut microbiome. And that might be just simply being... So people who spend more time outdoors have a much healthier gut microbiome than people who spend more time indoors. And that's not because they're going out digging their food out of the soil, that's just because they're spending time outside, so they're getting things on their hands, they're exposing their bodies to those, to those microbes all the time in that environment. They're living a less sterile environment um, than we live indoors, and therefore they, they seed it that way. But the microbes that you have in your gut can come from a range of places. So the foods we eat, the environment we live in, they also, you're born with a particular set, just depending on how you were born. So babies that are birthed through the birth canal have a much richer flora than babies who come out by C-section because they don't get all the vaginal microbes from their, from their mums, which are a really important way that we, that we seed our, our guts. So um, yeah, huge range of places that we can get them, but generally speaking, it's just our everyday environment. Nice. We talked a little bit about whole grains, didn't we? Nuts. I like pistachios, but they're a pain to peel. <laughs> Flax seeds. So there you go. There's the ground. You can, you can yeah, you can buy that in lots of places. You can get them in you can get them in bulk online as well if you want to. But even like a little and Aldi do ground black flax and linseed. Right, I'm vegan, but they're whole flax seeds, so that's incredible. Yeah, you do need to grind them. Grind so them. chia is okay to have whole. You'll still absorb a lot less of it, but flax you definitely have to um, grind. Even if you just bash them about with pestle and mortar. Yeah, or a, or a little blender, or just buy them. Buy them already ground. Spices we covered already. That's saffron in the corner. So just a summary. So most of our chronic diseases are preventable and reversible. And it's important to know that, that just because you've received a diagnosis doesn't mean necessarily that that's it for life. There are things that we can do. Um, reducing our intake of processed food, especially ultra processed foods, cutting out processed meats. So processed meats are um, classed as a type one carcinogen for humans. So bacon, hams, um, salamis, those sorts of processed meats have been shown to, to to result in colon cancer in people. Um, so important that we try and keep those out of our diet if we can. More fruits and veggies, we said up to 10 portions, it's shown to be really beneficial. Switching out our white and processed carbohydrates for our whole grain alternatives is a massive impact. You also can eat less of whole grain ones. It really, they really fill you up more. If any of you have ever had a white ham sandwich, within about 20 minutes you're hungry again. Whereas if you have whole grains, actually it keeps you much fuller for much longer, so you'll be less likely to need to snack later. Eating nuts and seeds regularly. And we talked about reducing consumption of animal products at the beginning of the, the talk. So really thinking about, well, do I always need to have 
beef in this stew? Can I have something different? Is, is there one day a week where maybe I just eat, I just eat veggie foods, um, I just eat more beans and legumes in my, I do a chilling from carne with just beans instead of with, with beef in it, or I do a stir fry with some tofu, or maybe just the veggies, rather than having chicken in it every time. Um, looking at your lunches and saying, well, do I need to have a ham sandwich, or could I actually just have a lentil soup on this occasion? Um, breakfast is a really easy place to make it generally speaking plant-based so it has real health implications if you're able to do that and if you want to don't opt for low calorie diets haven't really touched on dieting can do if people want to there's no evidence that low calorie diets work you lose a little bit of weight your body realizes what you're doing it slows down its metabolism you stop losing weight maybe even start to gain a little bit of weight again you get bored because you're tired and weak and hungry. You go back to eating the way you did before. Your body puts on more weight mm -hmm. just to prevent itself from ever being starved again. Mm -hmm. You go through that cycle several times, you end up bigger each time you do it. So do not go for low calorie diets. You will end up bigger in the long run. Up for more whole foods and you will end up slimmer in the long run. So changing the way you eat rather than how much you eat or you know, what you eat is the key. And carbs are not your enemy. Carbs do not make you fat. Our body run on carbohydrates. Our brains need glucose. It can't survive on very much anything else. It's just about where you get them. So if we're talking about carbs, as in French fries and, um, and snacky biscuits, well, that's obviously not as good for us as if we talk about whole grain rice and beans, or we look at, you know, a sourdough loaf, or something that's got all of its fibre still in it, because it's full of fibre. So frozen vegetables have been shown to be just as good for you as fresh vegetables. I think there is a small amount of the nutrients that get degraded during the freezing and defrosting, but to be honest with you, it's negligible. And if it means that you have an extra couple of portions of veggies, way better for you. Even tinned vegetables um, are, still, are still good for you. You still get things in there. So no, absolutely, you're right, because it is difficult if you're buying in fresh produce, it gets wasted. Unless you're cooking in bulk, which is another thing to do, actually. It's get loads of things, do a big something and then either freeze it off or, or portion it off for later. Dog's getting bored. Yeah, it's right, it's all, you've got a high amount of protein in a lot of vegetables that people don't realise. Loads, realize. yeah, you know, loads. You throw the animal products in, so broccoli's really high in yeah, protein, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, you, um, yeah. You don't need as much protein as people think either. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to have a protein source with every meal because all of your vegetables, and particularly your whole grains, are quite high in protein. So, for example, oats. Um, have 10 grams of protein in 100 grams of oats. It's 10% protein, and that's just oats. People just think of it as a carbohydrate, but foods aren't just one thing or another thing. Broccoli has got a decent amount of protein, and obviously to get as much, as much protein from a load of broccoli as you would from a slice of chicken, you'd need to have a lot of it, so you will get less. But yeah, vegetables are really um, good sources of protein. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a special source of it. Um, but thinking about your... Um, your legumes, so your lentils and your beans and your chickpeas, are a really high source of protein. So if you are going to have a meat-free day, that might be the way to introduce those things um, to those meals that you're cooking. But yeah, you don't have to. We quite often have stir-fry veg with um, whole grain noodles, brown noodles, um, without anything else in it. Mm. That's just the sauce and the flavouring. So yeah, you don't have to, that's a good point. Yeah. 